Hey everyone, in this video we're going to take a look at book 5 of the Bello Gallico and start with chapter 24, which covers Ambiorix's revolt. So this is where we start with the AP curriculum diving into book 5, and it is a nice part of the of the narrative of De Bello Gallico. It kind of ties back into book 4, which we have been doing earlier. And what we're going to do in this video is start by doing a little bit of the historical background just so you understand what's going on, and then we'll dive into the actual narrative. Um, we'll translate it and just make sure that we're in a good place as we move forward. Okay, now before we do all that, what I always Always tell you in all these videos the first thing you want to do is make sure you get the vocab down so if you can either pre-read it yourself or grab a commentary anywhere you can find a vocab list it's very difficult to read the latin if you don't know what the words mean so always start there other tips i always recommend try to read this um uh, this story out loud right try to read de bello gallico um in latin with a partner so you can work on your pronunciation your speaking then if they can read it back to you you can work on your listening you never know if that's going to unlock latin for you. you don't want to shut those skills off um particularly in sort of the grind of an ap curriculum which is usually where you read this it can be a little tricky if you're just trying to do it all in your head bring it to life read it aloud the other thing i'd say as one last tip is do the read and reread method so when you do get to translate this read through it once write down any problem areas you have then try to fix all those problem areas. Vocab is pretty easy. Grammar, you might need a commentary or just try to think about it a little bit and figure out where you went wrong. But then you go back and you read the narrative a second time and a third and a fourth. And it's as many times as you need to until you can finally reach a point where you can read through the whole thing. You don't need any help, no vocab, no grammar, any of that. And you understand the vast majority, if not all of what's going on. That's how you know you're ready to move forward. Okay. So before we get into translating all that good stuff, we just want to reset um, on the stage of what we're doing here. Because for a lot of you, this is going to be the first part of looking at, at book five. And when you cover Ambiorix's revolt, it's important to understand the context of what led to it. Okay. So the key event here is the second invasion of Britain in 54 BCE. So back in book four, we looked at the first um, expedition to Britain. It was basically a disaster, right? Caesar acknowledges they didn't have enough men. They didn't have cavalry. Not a lot is accomplished. In 54, this time, Caesar goes back with a much larger army, right? I believe he brought five legions this time, and he actually did bring the cavalry. He has some success. He's still not conquering the island, but he does have some success, um, some victories, and kind of sets up the new um, agreement, the peace agreement with the native British tribes um, before returning to the mainland. Okay, so that return to the mainland is what's going to set off the events in book five. So in the winter of 54 BCE, he runs into a problem. So typically Roman armies would winter in their camps with food and the resources um, coming from neighboring allies, right? So the allies in the area would send them food and that way they can survive through the winter. The problem though in this year is that there was a drought, right? And Caesar's gonna mention this. There was a drought that led to a smaller harvest. There wasn't enough food in any of these regions, uh, regions to sustain his legions, okay? So he wasn't able to put his entire army in one place. So instead, what he ends up doing is he has to spread his army out across a much larger area, right? This would ease the pressure on local uh, citizens, local areas to provide the food and resources, okay? So since he's this uh, far spread out, and he's really in the, the region of, of Belgica, right? The Belgians, right? That northern part of Gaul. Um, since he's so spread out, now it seems like he's got an easier target. And the area we're going to look at specifically are his troops highlighted here with the red arrow in that more, uh, most northeastern part. OK, now this all leads to the Belgian tribes um, revolting. OK, so they decide to take advantage of this. The leader is a man named Ambiorix. OK, he's part of the Eberones tribe. You're going to see his story and how this all works and the tricks that he uses. But he's going to end up attacking the camp of Sabinus and Cotta, which is the one I highlighted in the previous slide. OK, and you're going to see how Caesar works the narrative and the speech he gives um, talking uh, through Ambiorix. You're going to see that it's really a way to praise himself and attack Sabinus and Cotta as he goes. Right. So he is going to deflect some of the blame um, off this revolt. And you're going to see that later on, Ambiorix is going to try this same trick on on um, Quintus Tullio Cicero's, uh, Tullius Cicero's camp, but it's not going to work. And in the end, Caesar's going to rush back and sort of save the day to put down this revolt. But you are going to see that there is some problem to begin with. Okay, so we want to unpack what, how Caesar delivers this narrative and sort of the messages he hides within it. OK, and again, you can learn a lot more about the background. I didn't encourage that you do. There's a lot of good videos and stuff you can watch, but at least get a sense of what's going on before you dive in. All right. So now we're going to take a look at the narrative itself. If you haven't done all those things I mentioned, pause the video, go do them. Otherwise, let's dive in. Your translation doesn't have to be exactly like mine, but it should give you a sense of what's going on. OK, so it starts like this. You have subductis nawibus, concilioque galorum, samara broi, uh, broi, why? Briwai, rather, per acto, quod eo anno frumentum in Gallia propter sic, uh, sicitates angustius provenerat. And then we're going to 
pause for a second, right? Because it's a very long opening here. Okay, so you start with an ablative absolute, right? With the ships having been drawn up, meaning brought back from, from Britain, right? And a council of the Gauls having been finished, paracto concilio, right? We're double dipping the, the ablative absolutes here, um, at Semabroi, right? Or, or, or Semabriva, rather, right? Um, so this is a town in the middle of that area where they're, they're all collecting and having this, um, this meeting. And a lot of commentaries point out that Caesar would do this pretty routinely, right? To bring everyone together, figure out all the issues and just keep order in the areas that he's conquered, okay? Then you have quote Eoano. So because in that year, the frumentum, the grain, right, um, proenera had grown uh, angustia scarcer, right? So it, there wasn't as much frumentum, not as much grain in Gaul, propter sicitates, right, on account of drought. So this is the drought we were mentioning. So since there's a drought, um, it leads to there being problems, right? There's not enough, uh, not enough food here. Okay. Now, one thing I would encourage you to point out is look at the structure kind of happening here, right? Um, you can already see he's setting up, um, you know, the problem with the drought, but he's also kind of setting up his own role in it, right? He's saying, well, you know, I settled everything. Um, you know, I've already set up everything that's going to happen. It's not my fault that the, dr uh, the, the drought um, brought to this sort of uh, lack of food. You can already kind of see that starting in the narrative here. Okay. Then you have coactus est aliter ac superioribus anis exercitum in hibernis collocare legiones quae in plures ceritates distribuere. Okay. So because of all this, the drought, right, he was forced, meaning Caesar was forced um, to place, collocare, to place uh, the army, the exercitum, right, in winter quarters. In uh, otherwise, or in another way, you might say, otherwise than, aliter ac, otherwise than superioribus anis in previous years. So in other words, he had to kind of allocate them into a different structure of winter quarters, which is what we mentioned before, otherwise than what he had done. And he was forced, coactus us, to distribute, right, distribuere, um, to distribute the legions in many states, plores civitates, right, in many different places. This is mimicking the intro we set up where he has to divide his army so that everyone can eat, okay? And then he continues the line by saying, ex quibus unam in uh, morinos ducendam Gaio Fabio legato dedit alteram in nervios quinto cicaroni tertiam in uh, esubios Luc uh, lucio roscio Dot, 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 right? He's kind of setting up one, two, and three, right? Three different things he does. So he's saying Unam, the first, right? One of which, talking about the legion. So one of which he gave to Gaius Fabius, the legate, right? So one of his legates, and I'll explain what that means in a second. So he gave them um, into the Morini, right? In Morinus, into the land of the Morini. Now, the Dukendam there is a gerundive, right? So you can translate it as going to be led or to be led, right? It's a gerundive. It's really showing purpose and it's modifying the word unam right in front of it. Um, but it's really kind of explaining um, the in morinos part, okay? So it's saying um, one of which or from which one he had given, right? He gave to Gaius Fabius was going to be led into the land of the Marini, right? In morinos. That's what the Dukendam is doing. Another right, is going to be led in among the, the nervi, right? And he, again, an, uh, another he gave, Dedit is kind of governing this. He gave to Quintus Cicero to be led, right? You're kind of implying Ducendum again into the, or among the nervi, right? And a third among the Asubi, right? Um, and again, it's implying that he gave to Lucius Roscius, right? So we're naming three different commanders where he's giving different legions and he's showing you where they're going, right? How they're being spread out. Then you have Quartam, and this ends the line, right? Finally, you have Quartam in Remis cum Tito Labieno in Confinio Trevorum Hiemare Iuse. Okay? So here it says a fourth, right? A fourth legion among the Remi, right? Um, uh, with Titus Labienus, who is a famous commander of his, right? He ordered to spend the winter, right? Iuse Hiemare, he ordered to spend the winter, um, uh, among the, the, the Remi, right, in the border or on the border of the Treveri, right, in Confinio Terror, right? So he's just laying out where all the different legions are going. So if we go back to that slide I showed you in the beginning, this is kind of explaining the different forts, the different areas, and where everyone is going. And if you want, you can actually take a look um, and you'll be able to see which commander was in which town or which uh, sort of camp.
Okay. But I think a more important thing to understand just while we're talking about it are who these legates are of the Roman army. So just to explain it, and I'm definitely not the first to do this. Other commentaries do it. But the leader of the army, the Dux, right, is Caesar. So he's the commander, the general, the, the, the leader of it. Now, directly underneath him, you have the legati. Now, in this context, a lot of people will translate it as sort of like lieutenant general. That's what they mean by legate. It's that subdivision just underneath so that uh, Caesar can kind of give orders and have things happen quickly. And he names a bunch of them in book five. You have Fabius, Cicero, um, Roscius, Labienus, Plancus, Trebonius, and then you have the two infamous ones, Sabinus and Cotta. Right. Okay, but this would help you to understand. I would encourage you, by the way, there's a bunch of good YouTube videos explaining um, how the Roman army functions. But this lets you visualize what's happening here when he's talking about giving legions to these men. These are his most trusted commanders. Okay. So then we pick up the narrative again, and we have Trace in Belgis Colocavit, um, Eis Marcum Crassum Quaestorum et Lucium Munatium Plancum et Gaium Trebonium Legatos Prefecit. Okay. So three of his legions, he placed Kolokawa, right? He placed in the uh, among the bel the bel guy, right? The Belgians, okay. <clears throat> he put he placed three of them there, okay. And Ace here, you could really translate best as over them, meaning because uh, he's going to talk about putting people um, in charge, right? It's this date of going with that that compound uh, prefacate. So over them, you might say, meaning over the legions, he put in charge prefacate, right? He put in command Marcus uh, Crassus as a quaestor. It's a it's a uh, a role in the army, right? You'll see it has to, what it has to do with, right? You can look it up. So Marcus Crassus, right? And he puts uh, Lucius Munatius, uh, Plancus, and Gaius Trebonius as legates. Okay, so there's Trebonius and Plancus. They're being put in as legates on um, these these lieutenant uh, lieutenant generals in charge of the three um, legions that are among the Belgae, right, in Belgium. Okay, then you have unam legionem quam proxime transpadum conscripserat et cohortes. Five, right, V, in Eburones, quorum pars maxima est intermosam acrenum, qui sub imperio ambi, uh, ambiorigus et catuoci uh, erant miset. Okay? So one legion, right, he's talking about one specific legion, um, which recently, Proxima is probably best uh, translated as recently, which recently he had conscripted across the Po River. Right? So he's talking about northern Italy, right? He had um, conscripted and five cohorts, right? Cohortes V, five cohorts he put among uh, the Eberones, right? So Misit is kind of governing this. He sent them among the Eberones, okay? Of which the greatest part right, is between the Mosa, Intermosa on the Mosa River, and the Rhine, and the Rhenum, okay? And who, right, who were under the uh, Errant, right, who were under the control, right, the Imperial of Ambiorix and Catavolcus, uh, okay? So he's talking about this specific area and who's there, right? This is the legion that's going to be in trouble. If you were to go back to the, the map, we're talking about the Eberones are right there. Um, you'll see this is the, the Ambiorix um, who's going to end up uh, basically ambushing them, okay? Then he continues and says, because we don't know um, yet at this part in the narrative who's in control of this one legion and five cohorts, but he's about to explain it now, okay? So he says, Eis militibus quintum titorium uh, sabinum et lucium arun arunculeum, there we go, catam legatos praese usit. OK, so over these soldiers, again, it's that dative um, kind of say over is a good way to do it. Over these soldiers, he ordered to be put in charge. He ordered Quintus uh, Titorius Sabinus and Lucius Arunculeus Cata, right, to be put in charge as legates. OK, so there's something interesting happening here. He has laid out all his soldiers and he purposely mentions this group last and gives a hint at what's going to happen. Right. This is on purpose. He's very much highlighting who was in control of this sort of fateful fort. Um, and we're going to see what happens to him in the revolt. But he's highlighting them. Right. He names them specifically and he's saying exactly um, who's in control there. And again, he did that for all the legions. But I think it's telling that he puts them last. Right. It kind of highlights them by where he describes them. And again, Cotta and Sabinus are going to be in that fort that I have with the, the red um, arrow here. You can see it's next to the Eberones, right? That tribe you can see. Um, that's what we're talking about here. Okay, so this is the region that's going to go into revolt and these two commanders are going to be in trouble. Okay. Then he continues, and you have ad hunc modum uh, distributis legionibus facilime in opii frumentariae, sese medere posse ex existimavit. 
Okay, so in this way, ad hoc uh, modem. So in this way, um, with the legions having been uh, distributed, right? It's just an ablet of absolute. Okay, he judged, meaning Caesar judged. Okay, that he was able. We have the indirect statement here, the judgment. Okay, that um, he was able to uh, medere, to alleviate very easily, uh, easily facilime the scarcity of. Um, frumentari of of uh, frumentari rather of corn. Okay, so he's saying that having done all this, right, distributed the legions in this way. Now Caesar was looking at it and thinking, okay, I've done everything I can to kind of offset Medari, right, to alleviate the problem that we don't have enough food, right, the inopii frumentari. Okay, so Caesar's looking and saying, yeah, I've done everything I can. And again, that's an interesting line because you know you read it and you're like, yeah, you did do a good job, Caesar. Did he actually, right? Should he have kept the troops closer together? This is an interesting question. But in his mind, he has done everything um, he could have. Okay, so it's almost like saying, don't blame me for what happens. Then you have aque harum tamen omnium legionum hiberna praeter eam quam lucio roscio in pacatissimam et quietissimam partem ducendam dederat milibus pasuum centum uh, contenebantor, okay? So, and, uh, however, okay, of all these legions, the winter quarters, right? So the winter quarters of all these legions, except for this one and the one which um, he had given, Diderot, he had given to Lucius Roscius um, in the most pacified and quietest part. And then you have Ducendum, so going to be led. He had given to uh, Lucius Roscius to be led into the most pacified and quietest part, right? So he's saying this is a very safe part. But otherwise, he's saying, um, the winter quarters of all these legions, Contenebantor, the winter quarters were contained, right, um, by uh, by a hundred thousand of paces, okay? So that last line is showing you the distance, right? Um, so the hundred, uh, the, by the by 100,000 of paces is another way of saying by 100 miles. And when he talks about containing, he's trying to say that they're all close enough that you could get there. You know, they're all within 100 miles of each other. So in his mind, they are, are all close together and they're able to sort of support each other, right? He didn't spread them too far. It's again, an interesting um, side note here that he's mentioning how, how close they were. Again, it almost feels like he's trying to justify what he did. And you'll see some commentaries even point out that this might have been um, an underestimate, right? So in other words, it was probably a little bit further than he wants to lead on. And again, if it was farther and it feels like it probably was, you want to think about why he didn't say that, right? Because if he had said, oh, they were 5,000 miles apart, it wouldn't really make him look like a, a very good commander. Okay, so just something to think about. Then you end with this line. You have ipse, uh, ipse in terrea, quote, legiones col, uh, colocatos, Munitaque hiberna cognovisse in Gallia morari constituent. Okay, so meanwhile, he himself, meaning Caesar himself, he decided, right, to stay in Gaul, in Gallia morari. Okay, so he decided to stay in Gaul in, uh, until, right, quote, um, until uh, the, the legions, um, uh, uh, sorry, until he had known, there you go, cognovisse, he had known that the legions. Um, were arranged. So here you have colocatas and uh, munitaque, uh, munitaque. So the implied essay um, turns these into the um, the perfect passive infinitive that you're looking for for the indirect um, the indirect statement. Okay. So it's saying he stayed in Gaul until he had known, right, or had made sure that the legions were arranged and were fortified. Uh, or, sorry, that the legions were arranged and the winter quarters were fortified is how you want to say it. OK, so again, Caesar is kind of saying or setting up that he did everything he could because he doesn't leave. Right. He specifically says I did. And he, you know, again, he is a very good general. So it's, it's probably true. But he's saying I stayed or I decided to stay in Gaul until everything was set. Right. I knew where everyone was. The legions are all arranged. Right. Colocatas essay and everything is defended. And he feels like he's in a really good place. OK, so just some things to think about as you go. You want to notice, like we said, how Caesar's outlining his command structure at the start of this chapter. Why do you think he's doing this? Well, you probably could say that he's doing it to highlight the two commanders that were not good, Sabinus and Cotta, right? Like I said, he's highlighting them specifically. Um, if he didn't want to kind of deflect blame, you could argue that he wouldn't even mention it all. He could say, I put the legions where I thought it was best. Instead, he says, oh, I left them with this guy, right? Or these guys, it kind of feels like he's deflecting some of the blame there. 
Okay. Another thing you want to notice is that at this point, Caesar probably felt pretty confident that Gaul was conquered. He's holding meetings. Um, you know, he's or organizing, uh, you know, winter quarters, all these things. He's not indicating at all that he's worried about a revolt. Um, but he does kind of recognize that some places are safer than others. So he mentioned at the end of the, uh, the, the, the narrative that he sent Lucius Roscius into an area that was more uh, the most pacified and the most calm, meaning that some of the areas really aren't. Okay. And again, here we're seeing the introduction and kind of highlight of Sabinus and Cotta. Keep those names in mind, right? They'll obviously be uh, important later on. And you want to think about, not that the, there's a right or wrong answer, but you want to think about how Caesar comes off in this narrative, right? Do you think it was a good idea to split the troops like this? Did he have any other um, alternative? Um, should he have known something differently or something better? I don't know, right? These are all questions to think about. Does he acknowledge any flaw in his plan? Not really. And you want to think about how he describes it, right? Well, they're all within 100 miles of each other. I Again, that's probably not entirely true. So you want to think about how he's portraying himself. I would argue he's, he's lessening some of the impact of what's about to happen with this revolt and deflecting the blame to say, like we've been saying, you know, I, I wasn't there. I put these guys in charge. You should blame that. OK, so just some things to think about. Hopefully the story, uh, the narrative itself uh, rather made some sense. and You're able to work through it without uh, too much problem. This is sort of um, one of those chapters that's more like organizational. You know, I did this. I did that. I did whatever. Right. There's not any battles or, or major events happening. So hopefully it's something that you're able to process and, and did pretty well. With. But if you have any questions at all, put them.